the best way to present yourself is to stand up forthrightly and to stretch out, you know, and to occupy some space and to you, you make yourself sort of vulnerable by doing that because you open up the front of your body, right? But it's a sign of confidence and that way people are most likely to give you the benefit of the doubt. And that's a good way to start regulating your mood. But not only does it directly regulate your mood to stand up, but also because if you straighten up and you present yourself in that manner, then other people are more likely to take you seriously. And that's another way that you can at least give yourself the bloody benefit of the doubt, right? And confront the world in a courageous manner. And that's a really good way of also of figuring out how to establish yourself in multiple competence hierarchies because one of the general rules of thumb about how to be successful is to confront things that frighten you forthrightly and with courage. And that's kind of a universal strategy for success. There's always going to be people around that are better at something than you are. And that's a problem because you can get jealous and you can get bitter and you can get resentful. And worse, you can get hopeless, you know. I have this, this friend of mine, he told me something so funny. He was decrying his, his lack of success in the world. And he compared himself to his roommate. And uh, he said, you know, his roommate, his college roommate was doing much better than he was. And his bloody roommate was Elon Musk. It's like, it wasn't like he was doing badly. Like he was doing pretty damn well. It's like, I'm not as good as Elon Musk. It's like, yeah, well, you and like seven billion other people, you know. But, but I thought it was instructive because you have to be careful who you compare yourself to. Now, you can't just not compare yourself to others, to successful people, right? Because then you don't have anything to aim at. You need an ideal because you have nothing to aim at, but an ideal is a judge, and you always fall short of the ideal. So how the hell can you have the benefits of having an ideal without having the crushing blow that goes along with having the judge that always regards you as insufficient? And this is something I've had to work out a lot as a clinical psychologist. It's like, well, let's say, you need a goal, but we don't want to let your distance from the goal crush you. So you got to set up a goal and then you got to make the goal, break the goal down into parts so that you can move towards it and you have a fairly high likelihood of doing it. So that, that's a bit, bit of practical, I wouldn't say advice, because it's better than advice. It's, it's some practical knowledge about how to go about achieving an aim. Set a high aim, but differentiate it down so you know what the next step is, and then make the next step Difficult enough so you have to push yourself past where you are, but, but also provide yourself with a reasonable probability of success. It's also what you do with children, right? You, you want to push them because they need to grow up and be more than they are, right? But you don't want to crush them with constant failure. So what you do is aim high and make the goal difficult but proximal. So your goal is to make today some tiny increment better than yesterday. And you can use better, you can define better yourself. This doesn't have to be some imposition of external morality. You know, you know where you're weak and insufficient, where you could improve. Think, okay, well, this is what I'm like yesterday. If I did this little thing, things would be just a, an increment better. Well, that's a great thing because you get the ball rolling and incremental improvement is unstoppable. You can actually implement it and it starts to generate Pareto distribution like consequences. It starts to compound. When you expect things to change, when you keep saying to yourself, I know the breakthrough is coming. I know healing is on the way. I know the right person is in my future. I know what God started, he's going to finish. Your faith can stop the creator of the universe. That's what activates his power. There were other people in the crowd that day that were sick. Many people that had needs, no doubt they bumped into Jesus, nothing happened. But this lady touched him. Are you brushing up against him or are you touching him? Are you living with expectancy, knowing that he's bigger than those problems, greater than that sickness, more powerful than that opposition? Or have you become discouraged, thinking it's never going to change? God is passing by. He has all power. Don't just brush up against him. Don't be passive and think you could never accomplish your dreams, never meet the right person, never start your business. Do like this lady, reach out and touch him. Release your faith, believe that it will happen. This lady was closest to her miracle when she faced the greatest opposition. Would have been easy if Jesus would have come, just a few disciples. She could have gone out and touched him without the struggle, without all the people in the way, but she had to fight through the crowd. The crowd represents broken dreams, things that didn't work out, thoughts telling you it's never going to get better, you'll never get well, never break the addiction. 
The crowd can be negative words people have spoken over us. You're not that talented. You can't accomplish your dreams. If you're going to reach your potential, you have to fight through some things. You can't have a weak, give up, this is too hard spirit. You have to be more determined than what's trying to stop you. You may get knocked down, but you have to get back up again. You need to have a made up mind. This disappointment is not going to stop me. I'm not going to let the mistakes I've made, the guilt, the regrets, cause me to shrink back. I'm not going to allow the bad breaks, the people that did me wrong, the rejection, the betrayal, cause me to get bitter and stay where I am. I'm going to fight through the crowd. Many of the miracles Jesus performed, he laid his hands on people and they were healed. But in this case, Jesus didn't lay hands on the woman. The woman laid hands on Jesus. Are you waiting for God to lay hands on you, so to speak? God, this problem's so big. When are you going to do something about it? Why don't you lay hands on him? Instead of complaining about the problem, Lord, I want to thank you that things are turning in my favor. Thank you that no weapon formed against me will prosper. Lord, thank you that you hold victory in store for the upright. I don't see a way, but Lord, I want to thank you. I know you have a way. When you do that, you're laying hands on God. Your faith can initiate the healing. Your faith can be the catalyst for God to do amazing things. Acts chapter 14, the apostle Paul was teaching people. He noticed a crippled man in the crowd. He'd been that way since birth and never walked. Verse 9 says, Paul realized the man had faith to be healed. Here the man was just sitting in the audience listening to Paul, but he must have had such anticipation on his face. Paul must have seen something in his expression, an expectancy that something good was going to happen, like a little child at a candy store. Paul was so impressed, he stopped his message and said, Sir, I can see you're ready for your miracle. Stand up. The man stood up and instantly he was healed, began to walk for the first time. Like that man, we should live with this anticipation that something good is going to happen. Yes, we've all had difficulties. We all have a reason to be sour. Don't let that talk you out of what God has in store. You wouldn't be alive if there wasn't something amazing in your future. Can your faith be seen? Can anyone notice that you're expecting to go to a new level? Are you talking like it's going to happen? Thinking like it's going to happen? Believing like it's going to happen? God is passing by. But if you're negative, I don't see how it'll work out. I never get any good breaks. I've been this way a long time. You may brush up against him, but you're not going to touch him. You have to show God you're ready to be healed ready to be free, ready to be blessed. There should be an expectancy. It could happen today. You could meet the person of your dreams this week. You could see your health turn around this month. I'm not a billionaire. You do understand that. We said, Mr. Harvey, we know, we know everything about you. We know your net worth and everything. I said, well, what can you all learn from me? He said, everything. He said, the reason we want to hear your story is because the majority of us that are billionaires, we inherited some money and we grew it. A couple of us in, inherited a billion, we automatically, some of us in, inherited 300 million and we turn it into a billion. You come from nothing. What we want to know is how you got to where you are after coming from nothing. How did you live in a car for three years and wind up on more TV shows than anybody? How did you survive flunking out of school? How did you survive all of that? We want to know that because in case something happens to us, we don't really have the information that you have on how to come from the back to the front or how to come from the bottom to the top. So I get asked oftentimes to speak. And so when I was telling them how I made it, I was telling them about the fortitude that I developed. And then I told them about the faith that I had. And that was really startling to them. Now, a lot of them are people of faith. But a lot of people who were born with a lot of money ain't really had to have a lot of faith. You understand? You have an idea of what it feels like. You've seen some kids get put in foster care. You've seen child protective services come to somebody's house. You've seen kids come to school with less. You might have been one of the kids that went to school with less. You have struggled to give your kids a better life than the one you had. They, they don't hear this. But I'm going to tell you something right now. You can be successful without an education, 
You can be successful without coming from a rich family. You can be successful. I don't care what color you are, what faith you belong to, your sexual preference. I don't care what's wrong with you. You can be successful. Everybody in your life will have a turn back moment. No matter who you are, you're going to have such a period in your life where it seems like it's not working. You're going to have doubts. You're going to have a lot of trials and tribulations and challenges. And everybody has what's called a turn back moment. You always have a moment in your life where the direction you're going, you will have to make a decision to keep going or you turn back. The sad thing is the average person turns back. But think about this. If you're going somewhere and you turn back, you can never get there. God's will is that you prosper. That's his will. Now, the fact that you done made some adverse decisions to stop your prosperity train from happening, don't dump that on him. God comes to give you life and give you life more abundantly. God got a great life for you, man, but you got to want something. You got to want it, you got to write it down. Most people don't have what they want in life because it ain't written down nowhere. You must write the vision and make it plain so that he who reads it will run to it. And even though it tarry, that means take a long time. Wait for it, for surely it will come at an appointed time. Say no philosophy. It's a fact. What you waiting on? Write it down. Put some faith on it. And then get ready to go to work. Sit up and you can believe in God all you want, but if you don't work, man, it ain't going to happen. Because he, he told you that, though. He said faith without works is dead. I'm just asking you, man, to try something new. If you've tried everything, it ain't worked for you. I'm just asking you, just, just try writing it down. Just try writing it down. After you write it down, I want you to put some faith on it. When you put some faith on it, I want you to work for it. I want you to believe in your heart that you will have it. Now, you might not want this life. You might not want what it takes to get here. But if you want this life, you got to put it in your work. You got to put it in, you got to stay prayerful, you got to never give up, you got to talk to God every day. Now, if that ain't what you want to do, then good luck. You keep doing what you've been doing, you're going to keep getting what you've been going, getting. I would try something else if I was y'all. I don't know what that dream is that you have. I don't ha care how far-fetched it might appear to be. I don't care how disappointing it might have been as you've been working toward that dream. But here's what I know. That that dream that you're holding in your mind, that it's possible that in the process of working on your dreams, you are going to incur, incur a lot of disappointment, a lot of failure, a lot of pain, a lot of setbacks, a lot of defeats. But in the process of doing that, you will discover some things about yourself that you don't know right now. What you will realize is that you have greatness within you. What you'll realize is that you're more powerful than you can ever begin to imagine. What you will realize is that you are greater than your circumstances, that you don't have to go through life being a victim. Someone's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. Disciplines work miracles. And here's the first piece that works miracles. Number one, do what you can. Do not let neglect grab you by the throat. Don't let neglect stall you on your path toward prosperity and health, being able to become powerful, influential, rich beyond wildest imagination. Don't neglect what you can do. If you can read, read. If you can change, change. If you can grow, grow. If you can take one step, take one step. Do not neglect to do whatever you can do at the moment. Of course, you can't run a multi-billion dollar business today. Mark couldn't either 10 years ago. Mark couldn't either five years ago. But I'm telling you, today he can do it because step by step, year by year, he took on what he could do. He didn't neglect it. He did the meetings he could do. He made the calls he could make. He read the books he could read. He took the classes he could take. And step by step, he got himself ready. You've just got to make a serious study of how others are influencing you, both negatively and positively. Now, maybe the influence 
of all those around you is okay. But just ask yourself. It doesn't hurt to ask. Who am I around? And what are they doing to me? Maybe the people you associate with and their collective influence is okay. But then again, maybe it's not. All I'm suggesting here is that you take a close and objective look. Everything is worth a second look, especially the power of influence. Positive influence can have an incredible effect on your life, but so can negative influence. Both will take you somewhere, but only one will take you in the direction you truly wish to go. It's so easy just to dismiss the things that influence our lives. The man says, I live here, but I don't think it matters. I'm around these people, but I don't think it hurts. I would take another look at that. I've got a good phrase for you. Everything matters. Now, sure, some things matter more than others, but everything matters. Everything weighs something. So you've got to keep checking to find out whether associations are tipping the scales toward the positive or toward the negative. It doesn't hurt to look, right? Ignorance is never the best policy. Finding out is the best policy. Remember, part of the purpose of this program is to get us to say, the days of kidding myself are over. I really want to know what I have become and what I am becoming. I want to know where my strengths and my weaknesses lie. What has power over me? What's influencing me? What have I allowed to affect my life? Perhaps you've heard the story of the little bird. He had his wing over his eye and he was crying. The owl said to the little bird, you're crying. Yes, said the little bird, and he pulled his wing away from his eye. You got the best two jobs in your life. You got your dream job, son, but this is only the beginning. This is not the end. This is not where I want you to be for the rest of your life. Pain is temporary. I've been trying to get that into your spirit. I've been trying to get you to celebrate pain. Are you hearing me? I'm trying to get you to have an understanding. That pain is your friend. That pain is going to take you to the next level. It's not your circumstances or your situation that determines if you're going to be successful or not. I've been telling you it's your mindset. I'm telling you, you're going through pain. I know what you're feeling. I know exactly because I've been there. I've done that. But you got to work through it. Work through your pain. On the other side is a reward. Listen to me. Pain ain't permanent. Your pain ain't permanent. You can get through this. You bigger than your pain. You better than that. I use the pain to push me to greatness. And I'm telling you right now, don't give up. I'm telling you right now, don't give in. Get through it. And if you can get through it, if you can work through your pain, if you can work through your pain, I'm guaranteeing you on the other side is a reward. I got to commit my very being to this thing. I got to I got to breathe it. I got to eat it. I got to sleep it. And until you get there, you'll never be successful in life. But once you get there, I guarantee you, the world is yours. I want you to make yourself one single promise. That you never go back on your own promise to yourself ever again. Then you can go at it and watch your life become what you actually want it to be. If you want to be great, the burning sensation is you having to accept that you fuck something up, not far as far along in the journey as you want to be and what you have to learn how to do. If you wanna be great, you have to learn to let it burn. And even though your impulse is gonna to be to turn away from that, to not look at it, to soothe it by saying it's them, it's their fault, they fucked it up, I grew, in the, grew up in the wrong place. Like whatever excuse you use to try to let yourself off the hook for not being where you wanna be, instead of saying, actually, the power is the ability to let it burn. Not only is it possible, that's probably the best time to do it. When circumstances and situations are pressing in upon us, the only way we can overcome them is to go within. To actually begin to ask very empowering questions with the awareness that this universal presence and its law will answer any question that you ask. 
So if you're in a situation that uh, is pressing on you and you ask, what's trying to emerge in my life? What is my gift to share? What is my purpose? Why am I here on the planet? Not just how can I pay my rent, not just how can I stop the pain. You, you ask empowering questions, the universe will answer these questions in a language and in a way that you can understand. What is it, what is the one power that you have right now in this moment that can change everything? You have it, I have it, we all have it. This one singular individual power that can change anything in our life, regardless of what's happened to us. I want to, I want to find more. All I can. And in that sack of shit, you have to dive in that to find more. Because if you're not willing to go in there and face yourself, you're not going to find anything. You can live right here on surface, man, right here on surface. So if there is an ending to this world and there is somewhere to go and there's a judgment, you're going to get there and you might see a chart. And that chart may tell you who the f you should have been. And now you get the rest of your life to think about that. Man, I could have lived a much better life. I just would have just suffered a little bit more. Whatever your answer is, you can do it right now, today, starting today, right? It's still possible. You can start doing that right now. It's empowering the present with the future. There is nothing stopping you from making it happen right now. You don't have to feel that way when you're 70. You don't have to feel that way when you're 80. You never ever have to feel that way if you start doing it right now. And you can do it right now. Even if it feels impossible, you can start working on it right now. You can start trying right now. You can start making plans right now because you're not there yet. We create our own reality. So that will be true for me. I'm saying you're going to come out the other side of this and you will be unstoppable. Your back's against the wall. You've got work to do. Like, let's go. And so the way I do that is I use my body because I've done this with athletes for decades, with billionaire businessmen. If you see somebody gets in a, in a slump of some sort, great athlete, Paul Tudor Jones, one of the greatest financial traders in the history of the world, you know? I used, I've coached him for 22 years. When I came to see him, this is a man who made 200% in 1987 when the stock market had his biggest single crash in the day, percentage-wise still. He made 200% for his clients, more money than anybody could dream of. Then he went to the moon, and he went down to earth and then he lost money. So I was brought in to turn him around. Well, how do you turn a guy like that around? Yeah. I watched him. His shoulders were down. He was breathing like this. He's sitting like this all the time because he'd been through these failures and it started to get stored in his body. Now in this state, this man is a genius, couldn't do it. So I watched films when he was at his best and he's like standing up and he's doing this. He's just going to sell this, make this happen. And the movement, the intensity, the way he used his face. And so I sh showed him a video of himself today. I showed him a video when he was at his best. And I said, what do you notice? He was like, those are two different people. I said, yes, but we can get back to this guy by just using the body first. Trying to use your mind, you'll go in circles. But I've been teaching for years that a radical change in your body instantly changes your biochemistry. 38 years of taught it. Two years ago at Harvard, they did a study, scientifically proven, what I've been teaching all these decades, where they, they call it power posture. Yeah, the Wonder stand, Woman stance. Yeah, standing right? like Wonder yeah. Woman or Superman for two minutes. Yep. Or, or like you see a guy who's like this, pulled back like that for two minutes, literally increases your testosterone in your biochemistry within two minutes by 20%. It drops cortisol by 18%, which is the stress hormone and it increases your chance of taking a more risky behavior, which is what's required of a leader, by 33%, two minutes. Now that's just standing a certain way. I show people use their voice, their body, their movement, which is 10 times more dynamic than just a stiff stance. And when you change your state, your mental emotional state, you change your performance. Haven't you had times when you have like can't remember how to spell a difficult word like the or your own, or your own email <laughs> really or something tired, like that. Really tired, like can't remember. Yeah, like, like what your it is. Cousin's name. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And then you've had times where you're in the flow, where after you do something, you're like, <clears throat> you know, I did that. I don't know how I did it, but I did it. Absolutely. I was in the flow. Well, you're the same person. The only difference is state. So, training yourself to be in a peak state every day. I mean, you know, you think about like a great 
a businessman. Think of a great entertainer like um, Elton John has been around in rock and roll for what, birth? like yeah. 40, how many years? Is yeah, it 40 early years? 70s, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's Late mind boggling. And most people still like some sample of his music. Well, he's got to have days when he gets up to entertain when he thinks, if you make me sing that Daniel song one more time, I'm going postal, right? But he never does. Every single time he's in that same beautiful state. That's not because he's naturally like that. He's trained himself to do that. Like a great athlete trains himself. That's what leaders have to do. The state of the union, the state of the company is the culture. And the culture starts at the head. Whoever that leader is, their state impacts everybody else. So training yourself to be in that peak state is the key to it all. I think ferocity of spirit is critical for everybody, but we all have it. It's, it's like a muscle. Do we all have it? Yeah, we do. Courage unused, though, becomes weaker. You know, uh, determination unused gets smaller. Passion unexpressed gets smaller. It's like any muscle, the more you use it. And he's been using it for years. You know, his son, though, here's the other thing. He had a reason larger than himself. You see the pattern in all the people that have overcome. He wanted to do for his son. He, at the time, he was told me about his worried about all his employees, and he really cares about his people. And But here's the secret, though. You have to make that shift where it's no longer an excuse. If you give yourself an excuse, humans will take it. If you're going to take the island, you burn the boats. And he burned the boats and said, I'm going to find the answer. First, he shifted his psychology, came to my business mastery program, and then he got the skills. Because like I said earlier, it's not just confidence. you got to have skill, and he had both, and he found the way. Show them what you did. Yeah, um, after that particular business mo uh, mastery program, again, as Tony says, 80% of it is psychology, and then 20% of it is mechanics or the strategies. Mm -hmm. yeah. But unless you get the psychology down, the mechanics don't matter. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you from, from that day in November of 2008 where I made that decision that I was not going to fail, and I kissed my lady and said, uh, I'm, going, I'm going back to work. And we went out there and I learned how to export. And uh, when there was no market for steel in the United States, I was able to export um, to several different companies or several, several different countries. And um, we took off from there. We continued to grow. And it was just, again, it's about a mindset. It's about having a level of pride. For me, it was coming for, from where I come from, the Melio name, didn't mean a whole heck of a lot. And I was determined to change that because it's, it's something of what I call generational influence. I'm not doing this for me. I'm doing this for my son. The other thing you should do if you're not very industrious, industrious is discipline yourself. And so what do you do with that? Eat three times a day at regular meal times. That's a good thing to practice. Because that starts to put some stability into your life. Get up at the same time. I would highly recommend all those young people out there who are listening. Like, you want to get a jump on life? Get the hell out of bed in the morning. You know, as I've got older, I've got up earlier and earlier. Now, that's partly because you don't need as much sleep. But it's also partly because I've got more and more disciplined. Like, get up early in the morning and get your things done. Man, learn to get up at 6 in the morning and you'll be one deadly creature, especially if you can get to work. You'll have half your damn day done by the time other people haul their sorry asses out of bed. And so that's a massive, massive advantage. Look, Will Ferrell, uh, Warren Ferrell, not the comedian, Warren Ferrell, the author, he outlined data in Why Men Earn More, which is a book I would recommend, by the way, showing that if you work 13% longer hours, you make 40% more money. It's nonlinear. So you think, why is that? Well, imagine you had 10 employees and one of them works an extra 10%. It's not much. Well, how often is that person going to be promoted? Assuming you have a clue as a boss. It's like you're going to look at the 10 people and you're going to think, oh, that guy's always here like 45 minutes early. It's like, why don't we give him the promotion? Obviously, right? So these, tie, these small edges that you can manage like that, work an extra 10% or extra 13%, have non-proportional payoffs. That's part of the Pareto distribution. So get, get your sleep cycle organized so you get up in the morning. Learn how to do it. No excuses. I'm too tired in the morning. I don't like mornings. Who cares? That's not relevant. It's like discipline yourself so you can manage it. Schedule your meals because that's a good disciplinary routine. And then learn to use a calendar, like Google Calendar. Most of you, many of you out there, do not use a calendar. Okay, a calendar is not a prison, and it's not a tyrant. Not if you use it properly. A calendar keeps anxiety at bay. It makes sure that you do what you need to do, which is important, because otherwise you fall behind. But if you use it properly, it also helps you plan what you want to do. So I could say, well, lay out your damn calendar and design the days you would like to have. That's what your calendar is for. So you can put in all sorts of things in there you want to do and that would be good for you. And that's a really good, a really good way to start being more industrious. Make a plan. 
You need a plan for three years. You need a plan for the next year. You need a plan for the next six months. You need a plan for the next three months. You need a plan for the week. You need a plan for the day. You need a plan for the hour. All of that. All of that. I make lists constantly of what I have to do. And they're like daily, weekly, monthly, yearly. Right now, I can't look out more than about six months, you know, because my life is too complicated and chaotic. But, but you need a vision of who you could be, what character you could have. Three to five years out, you can't go much farther than that because life is too unpredictable, I think, to make vision that's longer term than that subject to there's too too much chance associated with it to spend a lot of time on maybe you can stretch it to five years and in rare cases you can have a 10-year goal but it has to be pretty low resolution but you want plans at all those levels of resolution you want to write the things down and what because what are you going to do you're going to stumble around and get get what you need you're going to stumble around and be useful to other people and it's useful to be useful to other people you know they want to work with you then they want to do things with you they want to have you around. They trust you. They open up opportunities for you. And if you stumble around like you're blind, you're not going to get anywhere. And then you're going to suffer. And then you're going to be bitter. And then you're going to be cruel. So that's, a, that's hell. That's a bad outcome. Hi. Welcome back to Mind Control. Most of us lower our standards. Why? Because who you spend time with, my friends, is who you become quality of your life is the quality of where you live emotionally. Like we all have a home. Angry people time, find a way to get angry, even if their life doesn't have anything to be angry about. We can always find it. Sad people find a way to be sad. Caring people find a way to care for other people. So one thing that identify is where are you living? What's your home? What's your habit? And then the way to change it is that when I was homeless, literally on my own just getting started, I didn't have the internet, but I decided I had to go to a library and I had to feed my mind. And I always tell people the first stage is, you know, weeds grow automatically. Uh, one of my teachers taught me, he said, every day stand guard at the door of your mind and feed it something good. Because if your worst enemy puts sugar in your coffee here, you're fine. If your best friend by accident trying to help you put some strychnine, you're dead. So if you feed your mind every day, 30 minutes a day of reading something, hearing something. Second, you got to strengthen your body. And the reason, Pierce, is fear is physical, right? So is stagnation. So is numbness. So is sadness. Such, so is rage. And when you go in and change your body by an intense workout or a run or even an intense walk on the blood, blood's flowing through you. Science has shown it instantly changes your biochemistry. And now your mind and body are working together. Third thing, all these people did in common, if you watch, they found a mission bigger than themselves. Yeah. Something that they want to aspire to that was worth more than their pain. And then the fourth thing is, you got to find a role model. You know, you heard it with Nick. Um, almost everybody finds a role model that makes it real. Yeah. When you get a role model, it becomes real to you. If you get a plan, you get a goal plan, and you take massive action. And the last step, number five, there's always somebody all worse off than you are, I don't care what you've done. So if you can go help somebody worse off, it puts your life in perspective, and it also reminds you life's not about me, it's about we. I always tell people, the secret to a great life, the secret to living, is giving. And there's, when you realize there's something you still to give, even if you lost your legs, even if you've been through a horrific financial situation, your life can improve, but more importantly, you'll have a meaningful life because your life will contribute to other people. Decide to develop the habit right now the habit of focusing on what's right in your world instead of what's wrong. The habit of focusing on what you do have instead of what you don't have in a situation. And as basic as that is and as well as you know it, you've got to make it a habit. Because those habits form the chain of your ultimate character, of who you become and how you end up living your life. We've got to condition ourselves, because if we don't, we'll go back to the automatic state that most people live in in today's society. The way to develop the habit is to go on a mental diet. It's that you immediately do not allow yourself to hold a negative feeling, a negative thought for seven straight days, day and night, even when it gets tough, even when somebody disappoints you, even when you get frustrated, even when you give your all and it still turns up lousy. Listen, if all I did was rant and rave on this tape and you didn't listen to anything else I said, but you took on this seven-day challenge, you can't believe what it'll do to your life. If you get yourself in a state of certainty that this is going to work, I'm going to find the way, and if this doesn't work, I will make the way then you tap a lot more potential. And when you're certain in your potential, you take massive action. When you take massive action, you really believe in something, you get great results. When you get great results, your brain goes, see, I told you I was a stud. People tell me all the time, oh, I'm skeptical or I'm pessimistic. I said, no, 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 you're gutless. It takes no guts, it takes no courage to be a pessimist, to say it's not gonna work, to try to find out what's wrong. What's wrong is always available. So what's right. So I'm not into positive thinking, but I am into intelligence. And intelligence says, see it as it is, don't make it worse than it is. 
The only way it gets better is if you can see how it is. Don't make it worse than it is. Don't try to make it so it's impossible to change. That's not true. It's not true at all. The second mandate, I think, to changing anything in your life, to believing your life, is once you see it as it is, not worse than it is, then you got to see it better than this. Because that's the thing that's missing from most relationships. There's no vision. I mean, without a vision, people what? Perish. And when a relationship has no vision for greater than where they are, that relationship is going downhill, if not destroyed. I believe that every relationship, every part of life, every part of a human being needs a compelling future. If the future's not more compelling than today, today could be tough, but if the future's compelling, we can get there. So just to remind you, first thing you got to do is feed and strengthen that mind. Read, listen, feed the mind, take control of that focus, stand guard of what other people are saying, focus on what it is you're here to give, what you can control, what you can make happen. Number two, feed and strengthen that body. Remember, fear, uncertainty, they're physical experiences. So the best way to deal with something physical is get physical. Change that body. Go lift some weights. Go for that run. Do something that's going to get you in that state. But get that hour of power going, that 15 minutes to thrive, if you're familiar with that, to train your body and mind to be strong again. Number three, make sure you put yourself in that position where you find a role model that's going to inspire you and show you that way. Maybe it's a contrasting role model. You think your life's so tough? Find somebody with tougher who's really turned it around. Or maybe it's just somebody who's really succeeded. That you can now see there is a way. There's a way through. There's a way to make this happen, even in the toughest times. There's always a way. Four, make sure you get yourself into action. Get a plan. Take massive action. And then number five, most importantly of all of them, feed your spirit. Feed and strengthen your spirit. And there's only one way to do that. It's to find what you're grateful for and to take time. Whether it be prayer for you or just taking a moment to think about what it is that's so lucky in your life. There's, there's a rejuvenation in our spirit when we stop taking things for granted. And when most importantly, what feeds your spirit is to give. To find a way to do something for someone else who's worse off than you are. Because what is this all about? It's about strength and it's about perspective. It's about action. It's about emotion and it's about heart. And so many people, you know, miss the opportunity to feel like their life makes a difference. I'm a big believer that motive does matter, that why you do something people can feel, that people may be skeptical, they may have their judgments or their fears because they've been through so much, but in my experience, ultimately, why you're doing something people feel, and if you're doing this because some part of you knows that you're here in life not just to get but to give, then there's a spark that happens in other people because they feel the genuineness of that, and there's a spark that happens in you because it reminds you what you're made for. You know why kids love athletes? Kids love athletes because they follow their dreams. How much did they first pay you to give up on your dreams? And when were you going to stop and come back and do what makes you happy? I see guys who work at the same company for their entire lives. They clock in, they clock out, and they never have a moment of happiness. You have an opportunity. This is a rebirth. I'm a wake-up call. Maybe you're here because you need to hear this. Here. Maybe you're here because you need to dust off your dreams. Maybe you need to explore your imagination. Maybe you just need to identify your gift so you can get so you can quit tripping in your own life trying to figure out what you can do when God already planted inside you a long time ago. Remember your dream. All of us have things that we're believing for, something that we want to accomplish. Deep down, we know it's a part of our destiny. We can feel it so strongly. But then we hit some setbacks. We didn't get the promotion. The medical report wasn't good. Or a relationship didn't work out. Life has a way of pushing our dreams down. They can become buried under discouragement, buried under past mistakes. There are dreams buried under divorce, buried under low self-esteem. It's easy to settle for mediocrity even though we have all this potential buried on the inside. Your dream may be buried. The good news is it's still alive. It's not too late to see it come to pass. We've all been through disappointments and setbacks. Life happens. But instead of remembering the hurt, the pain, what didn't work out, 
the key to reaching your destiny is you have to remember your dream. Imagine, if you will, being on your deathbed and standing around your bed, the ghosts of the dreams, the ideas, the abilities, the gifts given to you by life, but you, for whatever reason, you never pursued those dreams. You never used those gifts. You never used those talents and those abilities. You never wrote that book. We never heard from your leadership. And there they are standing around your bed looking at you with large angry eyes saying, we came to you. And only you could have given us life and now we must die with you forever. And the question becomes, if you died today, what dreams, what ideas, what abilities, what gifts, what talents would die with you? Maybe that's why one woman said, oh, God reached the point of death only to realize that you've never lived. Maybe that's why Henry David Thoreau said, oh, God, to reach the point of death, to realize that you've never used all your potential, all of the things that had been instilled in you. Look, man, identify that God-given gift and get to pursue it. I had a partner. When we was growing up, all he did was cut grass. I'm talking about he cut grass every day. Two dollars for the front, two dollars in the back. But boy, this boy was talented. He had one of them push lawn mowers with a single blade on it. He was so good, he could take the blade, lower it, and raise it. He could cut patterns in your yard with a push lawn mower. He could put your initials in your grass. You know how big that was in the hood? You get a W in your damn yard. This boy was $2 for the front, $2 for the back. He didn't go play with us nowhere. We going to the swimming pool. Now nah, I got cut Miss Jackson grass. Hey man, we gonna go to the little uh, school dance. Now nah, I got to get up in the middle. I got I got cut Miss Stanley yard. We used to laugh at it. A grass cutter, grass cutter. This boy today in Cleveland, Ohio, he got a landscaping company. You know how much this dude grosses every year? Four million dollars. Four million dollars. You know what he do? He cut grass. He got 38 trucks on the road. He got every contract in the city, every office building, every mall. He cut grass. He cut the grass so good when it's snow in Cleveland, he put plows on the front of all 38 of them trucks. He got all the snow, move, snow removal contracts. This boy make $4 million. You know what he do? He cut grass. He cut grass. You may not understand why a business didn't make it, why a person walked away, why you came down with an illness. You were doing the right thing, but the wrong thing happened. It's all a part of the process. What did you used to be excited about? Now you think it's been too long, it's too big, it's not possible. You don't think you could write the book, finish school, see a marriage restored, start the business, you know, get your passion back. You have not missed your opportunity. You have not had too many bad breaks. You're not lacking. You didn't get shortchanged. People can't stop you. Bad breaks, disappointments, loss. There are seeds of greatness in you right now. Dream so big that you can accomplish them on your own. As you think about your goals and dreams, not only is it possible, not only must you decide that it's necessary, that it's a non-negotiable, you have the ability to do more than you could ever begin to imagine. But when we live in a world where we're told more about our limitations rather than our potential, when, when we look at our environment and the people and the conversations that we're exposed to early on, we begin to form a limited vision of what's possible for us. 
And so as you think about your goals and dreams, here's who I can share with you because of what I've gone through, and you know this to be true. Changing a life is hard. Why pay the price? Why work this hard? Why go this far? Why try to learn this much? Why try to do it all? Why try to see it all? Why try to have it all? Why do it? Why learn it? Why study? Why put yourself out? Why try to take on this much responsibility? Why develop yourself to the full? Why try to become all that you can possibly become? Why try to earn as much as you can earn, share as much as you can share, develop every skill you possibly can, see every human you possibly can, go to every class you possibly can, touch everybody you possibly can? Why do that much? Why go that far? Why share that much? Why give that much away? Why try to see everything? Why try to do everything? Why try to become everything? That's a good question, why? And you're the only one personally that can answer that question for yourself. You've got to have your own list of whys. Here's what I want you to do when you go home after you've left this extravaganza. Work on your list of whys. One of the big thrusts for success is to come up with a strong enough why. In leadership training, here's what we learn. If the why is powerful, the how is easy. But if the why isn't strong, if your goals aren't powerful, if the vision isn't clear, the old prophet said, without a vision, we die. Without a vision, we perish. Without a dream, we're nothing. From the movie, The Professionals, I listened to Bill Heron give his testimony yesterday from the movie The Professionals that said, we joined because we believed. We stayed because we were committed. We left because we were disillusioned. But we came back because we were lost. Without a dream, we are nothing. Thank you so much for watching till the end. Don't forget to share your thoughts in the comments section. Please also like, subscribe, and share this video with your friends and families. Please watch our other motivational videos. Thank you again.